Okay, I might take a seat while I go through this one after that. Okay, what I'm looking now is macro and how macro fits, and I've trashed micro and finance, so far macro is not going to get away scot-free either. And of course, one th thing about the usual courses in finance and economics is they're neatly divided of one from the other. Uh, ages ago, when this used to be a faculty of business and technology, the then dean, who was a chemist, told me that he was thinking of splitting the, fact that the, the then department of economics and finance in two, because as far as you can see, there was absolutely no overlap between the finance courses and economics courses. That was actually one reason I got the right to run courses that combined the two, because we wanted to hold the group together. Uh, so that, that fits with a standard neoclassical view that there's no link between economics and finance or vice versa. So if you look at the ISLM stuff you've done in macro, that tells you the money supply is exogenous. It's set by the central bank. That's why when you just derive the money, the LM curve and the ISLM model, you've got a vertical money supply saying it's not under the influence of the market, the government sets it. Changing the money supply changes the interest rate, but there's no other link between economics and finance in that macro model. And the model I'll be showing you later, the DSGE models, are even more extreme. They've got no role for money, what, role for money whatsoever, so they do have an interest rate setting component in there. Uh, looking in the other direction, going from finance to economics, you get the efficient markets hypothesis telling you that the value of a firm is set by the net present value of the expected cash flows from its investments. It has nothing to do with whether the firm is financed 100% by equity or 100% by debt. And of course, you get from that finance has no impact on the ma on the economy. And of course, the most extreme element of that was the uh, Medigliani Miller dividends irrelevance theorem that basically said that the amount of debt didn't matter because if a firm has lots of debt, people can buy it with straight cash. If it has no debt, people can buy it with gearing. Therefore, the value of the firm is unaffected by the amount of debt the firm itself has. Now, of course, that theorem and everything else that comes from a cap M fails when you see empirically that. CAPM simply doesn't work. So, ipso facto, you can argue that debt does value matter for the value of a company, and debt might also affect the economic performance. So you can't knock debt and, the, and how firms are financed out of, the, out of economics anymore, and you can't have that neat division between economics and finance. Now, that means you need a combined economics and finance, which is what I'm teaching in this course. And if you look at the data as well on, as I've shown you on CAPM, it contradicts the CAPM model. It also contradicts the standard ISLM model. Now, I say the empirical failure of CAPM is widely acknowledged. It's widely acknowledged by people who actually help produce the theory. The ones who still teach it often don't realise that there are problems. There are lots of debate about the empirical problems of uh, ISLM analysis as well, but there's still no alternative that's accepted in economics. So what you get is people continuing to teach stuff that empirically you know is wrong. Now what I'll do instead is take a look at the data, compare the standard theories to it, which I've already done with finance and micro, of course, and try to introduce theories that have a better match to the data, even though they're not accepted yet. I'd rather give you something that's feasible than teach stuff that I know is wrong. Uh, but let's take a look at the state of macro, as you've been taught it before. And when you look at the, the relationship of finance to economics, you're also looking at the relationship of money to the real economy. And if you look at the way money is treated in macro, you're pretty much told money doesn't matter. The basic idea is money is just there to make it easier to exchange goods in what is really a barter system. And you'll see people talking about what they call money neutrality, and that's a major thing for the uh, dominant neoclassicals right, right now, that money is neutral in the long run, has always been an argument of neoclassical theory. Now, when Friedman first put forward the quantity theory of money, he argued that there could be some short-run impact of increasing the money supply on real output. Uh, but overall, that would eventually be wiped out and you'd go back to the long-run equilibrium. All the ideas that, that you, you would now be told on such things as Nehru, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, not Nauru, where they're trying to send the refugees, uh, that's, that sort of stuff uh, is pretty much arguing the money is neutral in the long run. And in the short run, they're also arguing that there's no, no, no impact. So what you've told is that capitalism really is just barter minus the double coincidence of wants. If you have a, a, a pure barter system, and by the way, there is apparently and has never been any such thing, though it's the, the mythical model neoclassical economists have of how capitalism works. If you had a barter system, then a consumer had commodity X and wanted Y would have to find another consumer who had Y and wanted X.
But if you have money, uh, instead the idea is that A can sell X for the dollar value and buy Y, B can sell Y for its dollar value and buy X, and they don't have to meet up with each other. So money is just there for a convenient, convenient numeraire to make barter easier. That's the fundamental argument in neoclassical theory. And that dominates both finance and, uh, and macroeconomics. Now, in, in, in macro, the way it turns up initially is in the quantity theory of money, the argument that the money supply is controlled by the government uh, and therefore inflation, when it turns up, is due to money growing faster than the growth of the economy and that turns up not in increased transactions, which would be where money would be non-neutral, but it turns up in increasing the price level. And you get a, fundamentally an argument that the output, output level of the economy, output, output side and the price sides are independent. Now, in the short run, Friedman argued that there could be people would slowly adapt to a, a faster rate of growth of the money supply than they expected, with adaptive expectations. And when there was an increase in the money supply, that would fool them to believe there was an increase in real demand. They'd work harder, increase output, but ultimately they'd realise it was just caused by a boost in the money supply. So you'd go back to a vertical long-run Phillips curve. Um, but then under rational expectations, we took over after Friedman, the argument there was that there would be absolutely no impact any increase in the money supply would simply cause inflation and you have a vertical short run Phillips curve. So let's look at the, the, the shared model that lies beneath that uh, about how money is created. Because okay, you've got to have some way in which money is created in the model. And the basic argument from the neoclassical point of view is that the government or the reserve bank or the central bank creates high powered money, notes and coins in the government deficit. That is then deposited in private bank accounts, so either they put, you know, People get the money through uh, dole checks or through government services. <coughs> Pardon me. And the money multiplier then determines the ratio between that increase in fiat money and broad, broad credit money. So you get the idea that the, the total level, the level of money is a money multiplier multiplied by the monetary base. And back when they tried to control the amount of money uh, directly in the quantitative control days, back in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, They'd set M as a policy variable. Now, the Chinese are still doing that, and I think there's a good reason why the Chinese are likely to be more effective at that. Not a good career move to not do what a Chinese government official tells you to do. But we don't have quite the same uh, rigid controls over here. Anyway, back in the 60s, we did try that, and the, the banks would be told you've got to keep a certain percentage of deposits in reserve. Um, oh, actually, it should be a reserve ratio there rather than M. M's the inverse of the reserve ratio. Now that's set in directly by the Basel, Basel Accords. So Basel II tells the banks they've got to keep a certain proportion of their assets in a certain level of risk-weighted uh, securities. It works out to a ratio of about 8% reserve ratio, where, whereas the old ratio used to be between, between 8 and 12%. So whether it's set by a Basel Accord system or by directly trying to manipulate the money multiplier, the mechanics are basically the same. And this is the deposits create loans. There's a certain amount of money created by the government. Let's say we've got $100 of base money created. That's paid to individuals through wages or payments for goods. The individuals then deposit that money in bank accounts. And let's, the bank, this, this is where the reserve ratio comes in. Let's say the banks are told they've got to hang on to 20% of any deposits they have given to them. And they can lend out the rest to borrowers. So in this case, the bank can, must hang on to 20, but can lend 80. So the person who borrows that money then redeposits in another bank account uh, and payment, it might be payment for services, might be the way it gets there. And ultimately the amount of money in the system will converge to being the, ima the amount of base money injected divided by the reserve ratio or multiplied by the inverse, which is the money multiplier, and that will be $500 and that's the fractional banking model. Now of course that process takes time because you can't just get the money and lend it out straight away. You've got to find somebody to lend the money to. They have to deposit it. That money then has to be lent out to somebody else. So there's a time lag in this particular model. So what you might have is, let's say there's a bank that wants to make a loan, but either has no deposits or it's already on its reserve ratio to begin with. It has to wait for a depositor to come along with that $100 and deposit the money in the bank. And then the bank now, looking at the, the net situation, starting from zero when the depositor turns up, it now has $100 in liabilities, which is the cash that it must return to the, to the depositor if the depositor asks for that money bank, but it also has the asset of $100 worth of cash. So I can lend 
$80 of that out and hang on to 20 as it's required to do, that lends that to say firm F, then having done that, it's still got $100 worth of assets, but those assets now $20 in cash and $80 in the loan to F. Now F then goes and buys some goods from a supplier and the supplier then deposits that money back in the banking system. I'm not looking at going to a different bank here, but saying it just goes back into a bank in the banking system. So the banking system now has uh, two deposits, $100 and 80, but it's also got a loan of $80 to F. So the loans and the liabilities, the assets and the liabilities have risen. And the banking sector can now hang on to $16 of that additional money, lend out 64. You now have 180 in assets for the banking sector. It's growing. Okay. And then the firm buys more money and so on. And as the process keeps on going, ultimately you could have converged to that situation where there is now $500 worth of assets and liabilities in the system. The liabilities of $500 worth of deposits, they're backed by assets which are $500 of worth, of, worth of cash plus loans, $100 worth of cash, and $400 worth of loans. Okay? Now that takes time. The bank can't lend until it gets deposits in the first instance, so the bank is powerless until the deposit turns up. The initial money is fiat money created by the government, which you know, printing money or running a deficit. And the money supply is exogenously determined by the government with credit money simply being a passive amplifier of what the government does. That's the basic mechanism of the conventional model, how money is created. Now that feeds into the ISLM model. So you have the idea that the, the base money is set by fiat money injections. The credit money multiplier then tells you how much money is inside the system. That's your money supply. And then the model uh, takes that as determining the, the money market side of the system. You've got to look at the goods market as well and you get these two components. So here's the fixed money supply for the, for the money side of the argument and the money demand, which depends upon the rate of interest and the level of income. So you have a fixed money supply set in that mechanical fashion I've been through a moment ago and a variable money demand where there's two factors that set it, the rate of interest and the level of, in of income. And the product is the LM curve, because if you have a higher income, you need more money to finance transactions. But if you have a higher interest rate, it actually costs you money. You, you forego a return by having your money in cash rather than having it in an asset. So what you get as a result of that is a downward sloping curve in the rate of interest for money demand. The higher the rate of interest, the lower the demand for money, because you'd rather have your, your assets held in an income earning situation rather than just in cash. But as income, so the income rises, you need more money for transactions. So working from that first point and mapping across to income, you can say that there's the combination of the interest rate given the level of, uh, given the supply of money and the interest rate and the income level, that's one point in, 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 in income, in the income investment, or I'm getting a bit garbled, being a bit tired, uh, the income and interest rate uh, spectrum. Then you consider a high level of income. That's going to require a high level of money for, for transactions. They've got a higher de demand for money. That will then mean you have a higher interest rate, given the higher income, and you draw your LM curve, it slopes upwards. Okay? This is all stuff you would have done, I'm sure, before in macro courses, but I need to remind, remind you of it to uh, come to a certain punchline you haven't got in your macro courses. Now, the IS curve goes in the opposite direction. Here investment demand is seen as a negative function of the rate of interest. The lower the rate of interest, the more investment there's going to be because more projects will have a positive net present value. Savings are seen as a positive function of the level of income. The higher the level of income, the more you save, income being a residual after your consumption. So the IS curve is now going to show you all the com combinations of the interest rate and income that give you equilibrium in the goods market. It's extremely important that this both the LM curve and the IS curve are curves that define equilibrium situations in the two markets you're looking at. So here's investment as a function of the rate of interest. And up here we have savings as a function of the level of income. The multiplier maps you from, in from investment to income. And you can just invert the, uh, the, I the IYS curve there, just using a 45 degree line. So you can say, given some one combination of the interest rate and the level of investment, there's one position on the IS curve, 
There's a second, you've got a downward sloping curve to defining equilibrium situations in the goods market. Put them two together and bang, you've got the wonderful little intersecting curves that economists love so much. That's ISLM analysis. And the intersection of those two curves gives you overall equilibrium. The only equilibrium position for the entire economy is where those two curves intersect. Now, there should, of course, in macro be a third market for labour, shouldn't there? Fairly important market. Why is it not part of the model? Well, it's left out because of Volran's law. Because if you have equilibrium in two markets, the goods market and the money market, then the third market in the system must also be in equilibrium, therefore you can ignore it. Okay. Ever heard that one before? I didn't think you had. Okay. Now, I'm not worried about the mechanics so much because I want to emphasise the essential role of the money being exogenous in this model and also the essential role that equilibrium plays in defining the model in the first instance. So let's just take a, a bit more of a critical look at the ISLM curve than you've done beforehand. And the best person to critique the model is the person who developed it, John Hicks. He wrote a paper in 1981, and this is in a, what you might call an obscure journal because it's not a mainstream neoclassical journal, Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics. The reason he published the paper there was because the editor of the journal, Paul, Paul Davidson, editor and founder, argued with John Hicks for years, decades, that the model was a bastardisation of Keynes and finally convinced Hicks enough of it. So I imagine Hicks submitted the article to um, Paul Davidson's journal for that reason. I also expect we'd had a damn hard time getting it published in a neoclassical journal, even though he was John Hicks. Now here's the opening line from that article. The ISLM diagram, which is widely, though not universally, because he's talking to post-Keynesians here, except that as a convenient synopsis of Keynesian theory, is the thing for which I cannot deny that I have some responsibility. Well, ain't that enthusiastic. I actually describe this article as ISLM and apology. Because he starts off by admitting it isn't really a model of Keynes. Now, I don't actually cover it in much, this much detail in the second edition of Debunking Economics, but taking a look at what he wrote there, it's a model he developed before he had read the general theory. And Keynes, unlike me whacking up my stuff on the blog every week, Keynes was not publishing free print drafts, only the people in his own circle, and Hicks was not one of them, were seeing the general theories that was being developed. So Hicks had not seen the general theory when he developed this model. It's Hicks's model, not, not Keynes's. Now, he then explains what went on. The paper that gave us the RSLM model is called Mr Keynes and the Classics. I think it's a 13 page article, it's in your readings, which most neoclassical economists, and you'll see why this is important later, accept it as being the general theory, because they couldn't make hide nor hair of, of the general theory itself. And Hicks said to here, he wrote four papers over this period, and there are two that he'd written before he saw the general theory. Now, one of them is well known, another was not. It's one that I read back when I did my master's degree. Wages and interest, the dynamic problem. Now, it became the core of what he called his dynamic model in value and capital. Notice he has dynamic and inverted commas there, and deservedly so, in my opinion, it doesn't qualify in my views of what is a dynamic model. But he said it's important here because it shows, notice this, he's judging himself. I think quite conclusively that the model, the ISLM model, was already in my mind before I wrote even the first of my papers on Keynes. So what you've been told is a Keynesian model was not Keynes, it was Hicks. So after developing this patent model, he was after to review the general theory as an outsider, and he said, as soon as I saw it, oh, we've got some things in common. Now, what have we got in common? Well, both he, Hicks and Keynes fixed their attention on the behaviour of an economy during a period that had a past, which nothing that was done during the period could alter, and a future, which during the period was unknown. Is there any other period? OK. Now, he importantly says expectations would nonetheless affect what happened. But what happened to expectations? He said, well, neither of us used rational expectations, thank God. That piece of nonsense only came in in the 60s. But he says expectations are exogenous. Now, that's a bit of a caricature of Keynes. But the key point is still there. It's Hicks is describing a pre-Keynesian model. ISLM was a model developed before Keynes published a general theory and without Keynes's involvement. Now, he said what they had in common, 
Well, they had, you know, how could they not have that in common? But he said there was a major difference in time between his model and Keynes's. Hicks's time period was one week. Now, not much changes in most weeks. Of course, that's not particularly true right now. Having fun watching the stock market now, are we, at the moment? Uh, Keynes was of the order of a year. Now, of course, most things will change over a year. And Hicks said as much. He said Keynes's model was a short period, and he think a year is a reasonable approximation. Mine was an ultra-short period. I called it a week. Okay, literally, it was a week long, his time period. And he admits much more can happen in a year than a week, and Keynes had to allow for a lot to happen, of course, including shifting expectations. But for him, for Hicks's model, he could imagine in one week that expectations didn't change all that much. So he was working with a constant expectations environment, and therefore what was determined by the model was the only thing he allowed to change, which were people's preferences. In this particular case, for bread, because his model was of a single, a single good economy where only bread was produced, and he hadn't actually worked out in the model how you made the machines that made the bread. It's a pretty stupid model. Complicated, but stupid. Now, talking about it, he said, well, it's, it's not unreasonable to say that prices in, that, in his one-week model would reflect the expectations they had at that point in time. So you could say they're in equilibrium. But he said, it's, when you look at ISLM and you're modelling the macro economy using it, if you're going to make sense of it, then you must insist on two things. First of all, you can't use a week. You've got to be working with a year, at least a year is your time period. And secondly, because the, you're saying the economy is determined by its propensities and you're ignoring expectations, then you're also assuming that the economy is in equilibrium. And he said, but how can you justify that when you're looking over a year? And if you are assuming equilibrium, then there's only one point in the whole diagram, Iceland diagram, that makes any sense at all. That's where the two curves intersect. Everything else is out of equilibrium. So you can't actually use them and be con here's consistent with the model itself. Now, for equilibrium to apply, when you're talking about something where expectations can change, expectations have to be fulfilled. And that's only possible if people are right about the future. So you can't have uncertainty. And he said, how can we avoid this? Thinking it through logically, to use ISLM, you've got to eliminate uncertainty. He said, but that won't make any sense at all because you can't even get an LM curve unless expectations are uncertain. So he's saying the model is logically incoherent. And this is how he slammed it. There's no other way to describe it. It's a bit of a, uh, um, oh, it's a mild slam, but it's still slamming it. He said, I accordingly conclude that the only way the analysis usefully survives as anything more than a classroom gadget is an application to a particular kind of causal analysis where the use of equilibrium methods is not inappropriate. There ain't no such situation. Hicks rejects ISLM. And 25, 30, you know, 30 years later, you're still being taught it as macroeconomics. Now that Hicks's summary of the problems was honest as far as he saw them, but it didn't go far enough. Because remember I mentioned the vol raising an assumption that you could ignore the labour market because the other markets were in equilibrium, therefore labour had to be. Uh, well, problem about that, and Hicks actually admitted it vaguely in the paper, he said there were three elements in Keynes's theory. Now Keynes, pardon me, did talk about the labour market, but Hicks was leaving it out and seeing only goods, but bonds and money. He drops the money. He admits to dropping the bond market using Volra's law. You don't need to bother about it because if the other two are in equilibrium, then the third must be also. So he said we can just ignore the bond market. But well, I'm sorry, the labour market's also being ignored the same way. He mentions the labour market and said we strictly need four, since you've got to distinguish labour from goods, obviously. But he said, well, again, I didn't have his quote here, but you don't need that because of equilibrium. I'm sorry, equilibrium only applies where the two, where the, all the curves intersect. Now, if you've moved away from the equilibrium point of the LM and the IS, then necessarily, under Volra's law, the other markets must also be in disequilibrium. So once you move away from the point where the two curves intersect, magically, other markets that you're ignoring suddenly turn up, and those other markets are necessarily in disequilibrium.
So if you wanted to apply anything resembling this model in the real world, and do any as a, as a tool model of the real world, it has to be a dynamic model where all markets are in disequilibrium and there are multiple markets that you're not even looking at in the basic ISLM diagram. But of course that's not what it is. So it's a waste of time, a waste of intellectual effort to take that model seriously. Now, I've got some good news. Neoclassical economists did abandon Hicks's ISLM. They haven't told you this yet. You'll find out when you go to do an honours course or a PhD, unless I can get rid of it in the meantime. They'll teach you what they call DSGE models instead. But they got rid of ISLM not for the reasons I've outlined. Because just as Hicks's ISLM model wasn't based on Keynes, the people who developed modern macroeconomics didn't understand Keynes to begin with. And they say it in their own words. This is one of the beauties of how garrulous Americans can be. Here's Robert Lucas, who gave us rational expectations in macro. He borrowed, borrowed from Muth in micro. But he gave a talk in 2004 when he was uh, president of the American Economic Association to the History of, History of Economic Thought Conference. And talking extempore, uh, this is his speech, his, his speech as it was recorded, and he said when he's thinking about giving the talk, he thought about Axel Lionhofer's thesis that ISLM was a distortion of, of Keynes. So he's aware that somebody said it wasn't reliable. And he thought he might find himself challenged about this being in front of a bunch of historians of economic thought. He would have been challenged in Australia. We've got some bloody good historians of economic thought here, far better on average than in America. Um, but he didn't get challenged. So he said, I'm going to think about ISLM and Keynesian economics as being synonyms. And then... He said, extemporising, I asked my colleague Gary Becker, another Nobel Prize winner from neoclassical economics, whether he thought Hicks got the general theory right with ISLM. Now, I love this one. Gary said, well, I don't know, but I hope he did, because if it wasn't for Hicks, I never would have made any sense out of that damn book. And Robert Lucas says, that's kind of the way I feel too, so I'm hoping Hicks got it right. In 2000 and bloody four two decades after Hicks said he got it wrong. That's the standard of, of, of historical research and history of economic thought in economics. It's disastrous. So they rejected ISLM not for the good reasons Hicks gave, but for the bad reason that it wasn't derived from microeconomics, that they thought macro should be derived from micro and be consistent with micro. Therefore, they're ignorant of the sun and shine mandrel de Burke conditions I took you through in lecture two that you can't even treat an individual market demand curve as a scaled up individual demand curve. But they believed that macro had to be scaled up micro. So again, here's Lucas talking about how macro evolved, same, the same paper, and talking about an earlier neoclassical interpretation of Keynes by Patinkin. He said Patinkin was absolutely right to use general equilibrium theory, which is a micro, the, 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 the general very version of the partial equilibrium micro you do in um, standard neoclassical micro, to use general equilibrium theory to think about macro. He said, we're both Volrasians, whatever that means, a bit of a throwaway line. I don't see how anybody cannot be. I'm going to show you how you cannot be Volrasian later in this course when you take money seriously. But he said he also held on to Patinka's ambition that you had to unify macroeconomics and microeconomics. And it was a very common view. He said, nobody was satisfied with ISLM. The idea was we, meaning neo American neoclassical economists, were going to tie micro up with macro. That was our job, and that's what they did. So they made a model of macroeconomics, which was an extension of and consistent with the micro they applied at the level of the, indiv the isolated individual. And to make it worse, they modeled the entire economy as a single individual. And the base model they used to do that was actually the growth model developed by Robert Solo. And Robert Solo on that model and also Ramsey modeled the entire economy as a single utility maximizing individual, the utility curve of the entire economy, growth of technology, et cetera, et cetera. That was, Luca, that was the uh, Solo Ramsey model. Now, when they bashed it around a bit and made it into what they called a business cycle model or a trade cycle model, they ultimately named it Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium. Sounds really great, doesn't it? Highfalutin name. Means bugger all. And I'll show you why later on, uh, in the course and certainly in, in, uh, in Debunking Economics Volume 2 or Edition 2. Now, this development actually split neoclassical macro into two schools. There's what they call the New Classical School, 
based around Chicago and the nickname that they have is the freshwater economists because most of the universities from which they come are on the, the Great Lakes system or the Great Rivers of America. And they see in perfect competition applied, the economy is in total general equilibrium, fully employed, no unemployment. That's their theory of macro. Good start, eh? The new Keynesians, now these aren't people who have read Keynes, I might add, if they have, they haven't understood him. This is Krugman, Woodford and Co. And they call themselves saltwater because most of them were on the eastern or the western seaboard, you know, around Harvard and UCLA and so on. And they assumed imperfect competition. And with that, they therefore got frictions that gave you unemployment. So that became this dispute between these two camps of neoclassicals. And there was extreme hostility originally. When you read Krugman, you'll occasionally find Krugman talking about people he's fighting with. He doesn't mean people like me. He barely knows the post-Keynesian school exists. The one post-Keynesian he's aware of is Jamie Galbraith, which is good. I'm glad Jamie's got his nose into the debate over there. Um, but generally speaking, when he talks about his rivals, he's talking about other neoclassical economists. And here's an interesting survey of the whole thing published in 2008. Now, take good note of the date, by the way. When this was first published, that particular paper, it came out, on, I think it was August 13, 2008, one year after the beginning of the global financial crisis. And this, was, this guy was the founding editor of a specialist journal for the American Economic Review on macroeconomics. He had the great uh, misfortune to have it republished uh, in the journal for which it was commissioned in 2009. I mean, it was damn obvious the American economy had tanked completely. And talking about the new classicals, he said, well, they became even more extreme under the leadership of Prescott uh, and got rid of everything that might give you imperfections. They believe capitalism would be described as being uh, having perfect information, uh, no money, no Phillips curve. They all disappeared completely. And they simply looked at the stochastic properties, the, the ways of the model functions when there's random shocks hitting it from the outside, of a representative Asian arid of economy which they call real business cycle models. Now, the new Keynesians, which is the Krugmans and the Woodfords of the world, and also uh, uh, Blanchard here, believed that the previous model, was, which was ISLM, was basically right, being because it gave you unemployment, but they thought you needed better foundations for that. So they had to explain why you got unemployment, and the only explanation they could see was you had monopolies, et cetera, et cetera, meaning otherwise, without monopolies, you'd have higher output level, and therefore you'd have full employment. And what they then got involved in was explaining where these rigidities might come from. It could be nominal rigidities, wages, the credit market, and so on. And he points out that the relations between the two camps are very unpleasant, and the new the classicals, the, the, the rigid neoclassicals, would say the, the new Keynes were bad economists, uh, crediting the discredited beliefs like Keynes' theory, and they, they thought ISLM was Keynes. Etc. Etc. The second would accuse, which the, the, the so-called New Keynesians would say, the first are purists who are building a scientific illusion. Well, they were both building a, a scientific illusion. Um, but ultimately, New Keynesians won. And here's Blanchard's summary in 2008 of how they won. It's hard to ignore the facts. I don't know. Economics are doing a pretty good job of doing that for the last century, but nonetheless, I said one major macro factor that shifting aggregate demand has far more impact on output than you'd get out of perfect competition. And changes in the rate, rate of interest had far more impact on real asset prices than you'd get, again, in perfect competition. You couldn't explain them using flexible price macro models. Um, they were unconvincing at best, so therefore even the most obstinate new classicals were forced to move towards the new Keynesian case where it's all caused by imperfect competition, etc., etc. So along comes a new Keynesian model. And that's, and notice the starting point for it is the neoclassical model. That's the pure form of neoclassical macro theory. And they had imperfections monopoly, which means therefore you're going to have monopoly power, therefore price setting behavior, therefore less than full per uh, uh, competition output, and discrete nominal price setting. So there's time lags between changes in prices. And it can be described in three equations. One which gives you aggregate demand, and that comes out of the utility maximising behaviour of a single individual. Between, with interest rates and uh, consumption being the arguments. Then a Phillips curve argument. And notice the Phillips curve has an output gap, and that output gap is the difference between what is actually produced and what would be produced if you had perfect competition, in the belief that the output level under perfect competition would be higher. I went through 
trashing some of that a couple of lectures ago. And then a reserve bank or a central bank following a Taylor rule where they put up the rate of interest by more than the increase in inflation to try to control inflation. And there's no role for money in this, amongst many other macro things. He said nominal money does not explicitly appear because they assume the central bank can adjust the money stock. They're assuming it can control the amount of money in the economy and that sets the interest rate. Um, now, they were really chuffed about this model back around 2008. And again, according to Blanchard, it was simple, analytically convenient, and it's largely replaced the ISLM for graduate courses and for macro modelling. And he said, similar to the ISLM, it reduces a complex reality to a few simple equations, but hey, it's great advantage. Unlike ISLM, it's formally, rather than informally, derived from optimization by firms and consumers. All great stuff. Obviously not aware of the impact of the Sonnenschein Mandel de Ver conditions on the capacity to aggregate from a single consumer even to a single market. Now, how do you criticise this model? Well, I mentioned it was derived from Solow's long-run equilibrium growth model. And lo and behold, the best critique of this model is done by Robert Solow. Hicks designs ISLM, Robert Solow designs DSGE. And he's, out, he's outraged. He's not like, this. Hicks at least realised, oh dear, I stuffed up, I'm apologising for it. Solow's position is, what have the hell have you people done with my model? And this is the tone that comes through. So talking in the early 2000s, he said, more than 40 years ago, I worked out neoclassical growth theory, and it was obvious to me that one thing it didn't apply to was the business cycle. He said, now if you pick up an article today with the word business cycle in the title, the underlying model will be a slightly dressed up version of the neoclassical growth model. And he said, the puzzle for me is, how did that happen? Now, ironically, Solo explains that a bit because in explaining what he thought about Keynes in the same paper, he said, I have absolutely no interest in what Keynes really said. Well, neoclassical followers coming after, after, after Solo equally had no interest in what Solo thought. So the high standards of American scholarship continue. But anyway, let's take a look at how Solo goes on about what he thinks about the real business cycle model, DSG models. There's a single immortal household, a representative consumer, that earns wages from supplying labour. It also owns the single price-taking firm. So it gets the wages and the profits. It takes present and future wage payments and returns as given and formulates an infinite horizon consumption plan Looking at prices, the firm, the firm also maximises profits by employing labour earning capital, blah, blah, blah. It's then disturbed by shocks every now and then, shocks to both the consumer's taste, the sole consumer, and the, and the, and the firm's technology, the sole firm. He said, well, there's nothing about this model that generates pathologies. I think of the model itself as the product of pathological minds, but in terms of the model itself, nothing can ever go wrong. All that can happen is shocks can come along that you can't anticipate, and the best thing a government can do is keep out of the way. That's all macro is really about, getting the government out of the way. Now, as he says, how could anyone expect a sensible, short to medium run macroeconomics to come out of that setup? Can you be more damning as a Nobel Prize winner in economics about the state of the economics you help contribute to? And he said, this has had no empirical success as particular theory. He said, what you really should be starting from, and, he, and Minsky makes a similar point that I'll work on with a great deal of emphasis in future lectures. Surely you want to account for the occasional aggregate pathologies that modern capitalist economies have, like recessions, stagnation, inflation, not to mention occasional booms. He said a model that rules them out by definition is unlikely to help. And if you take a look at Solo's, why has Solo got the, the criticism he has, as I, you often find that the more intellectual neoclassicals who actually read their own literature to some extent, rather than taking it for granted as people like Lucas and co do, he's aware of the SMD conditions. And he says, suppose you wanted to defend using this model as the basis of macro, how could you do that? Well, he said, I'm hardly enthusiastic about it and clearly you can't use realism as a defence with a model like that. So what you might say is that you can't other, do it than other than this, you must use it to meet the demands of the economic theory. His summary about that, 
I think this claim is a delusion. He said, you know from the SMD conditions, which he's obviously read, that the only uh, limitations those conditions place on what you can do at an aggregate level is that you've got to have um, Bolras law and continuous functions and homogeneity of degree zero and prices. He said, apart from that, you can do whatever else you like. But you've got to justify whatever else you do for its own sweet sake. You can't say you're forced to model the economy as a blown up single individual. Now, given that, is it any wonder that these models didn't anticipate the global financial crisis? In these models, no such event could occur. Unless there's a whole mass of endogenous shocks all at once, all pushing the economy down rather than some up and some down. And this is what he says. In this sort of model, you can't see what's going to happen. Once it happens, the model is instantly making adjustments again. It should return back to equilibrium. And that's one reason why neoclassical economists like Ben Bernanke are so puzzled right now as to why the American economy isn't recovering. The shock's over. Why isn't it back doing its good thing again? They are simply incapable of comprehending what's happening there. Now, I want you to have a look at, the, at some of Solo's papers here in the titles. He's talking about, in this first one, the transition from growth theory to this macroeconomics. But I love the title of the second one. I take it something good to see in a Jim Carrey movie? Dumb and Dumber in Macroeconomics. He's trying bloody hard to get the message through that this is absolutely stupid. And he's doing it, notice it, well before the global financial crisis hits. And in 2008, of course, it's starting to hit. You can talk about the state macros getting into. So that's the state of the theory you've been taught so far. You have a micro that doesn't work for both consumption and, and supply, a macro that's speciously derived from that micro, and a finance that doesn't work. That's what you've been taught so far. Is there an alternative? Can we do better than that? Can you actually model something? Well, if you look at what I've shown you in the, the, criti the critical stuff, stuff like behavioural finance, the fractal markets, and the efficient markets hypothesis, they're surely more consistent with the data in finance than the efficient markets hypothesis. And one way you can interpret that is to say that agents aren't rational as neoclassicals define them, which of course means having the capacity to accurately predict the future. Well, if that's the case, you can't have that separation of finance and economics. And to start with, whatever you produce has to be a combined theory. You can't distinguish the two. You can focus on one, but you can't leave out the other. Now, does it have to be built from agents who, rather than being rational, are irrational, or perhaps they've got bounded rationality, so they're rational but with limited knowledge, and therefore they don't make the sort of perfect decisions that neoclassicals assume? Well, not necessarily. I think this is actually a bit of a trap. Because economics has always tried to work up, well, economics post Adam Smith has tried to work from the individual up. And they've talked about agents and so on, and methodological individualism as a major fixation. But that may put economic modelling in a real straitjacket that doesn't apply in other sciences. Because, as you've seen, to do the aggregation and to have any consistency between the underlying level of the individual and the macro they're trying to model, you've got to make absurd assumptions truly absurd assumptions, and this is what they've done. So this emphasis upon the, on the rational agent is one thing. Behavioural economic comes on and talks about irrational behaviour, which does exist. I went through that stuff with you last week in, in the uh, inefficient markets hypothesis, and you've got Simon's talking about bounded rationality and so on. This is all implying you should use limited cognition agents, and quite a few economists, you know, good non-orthodox economists like Leanne Usher, do that in their modelling with using what you can do with computers now that you couldn't do back when economics first evolved. But there's another way to go about it, and that's not use agents at all. And if you look at other sciences, like biology, for example, like not other sciences, true sciences, of course, biology involves interacting agents, you know, sheep being chased by wolves, for example, predator and prey. Now, rather than modelling what individuals do and then aggregating up, they actually work at the population level and work down and say, well, we've got this population of predator and population of prey where the rate of growth of the aggregate population of prey depends upon what predators do and vice versa. They then write equations to describe at the population level and see what happens. And what you get are systems that actually look like the empirical data. So I'll give you the, my, your first taste of dynamic modelling here with predator-prey models. I want you to have interacting populations where you ignore the individual animals, but you talk about the dynamics at the population level instead. 
Now this is a flowchart program. I've shown you this, this a couple of times. I'm now using it to model uh, interacting populations of predators and prey. And to show you how that works, here we have a set of equations up here that describe the population of fish. I'll explain them in more detail in future lectures. Another set of equations here that explain the population of sharks. And they interact with each other. So I'm working at the aggregate level. I'm starting off with uh, two fish and one shark. <laughs> okay, not exactly realistic numbers. Well, let's just simulate it and see what happens. Pardon me, it must be 2,000 fish. Sorry, 100 fish, pardon me. 100 fish and 10 sharks. And what you get, the fish numbers cycling up from 100 to 500 and back down again. Shark numbers cycling from about 10 to 40 and back down again. Population cycling but out of phase, rather like cosine and sine being out of phase. And you put the two together and you get what's called a cycle, a limit cycle between the two. And that cyclical behaviour largely maps what happens empirically. There's no such thing as a pure cycle like this in actual recorded biology, but it's similar to what we see happening in biology. So they're quite successful at doing that and they elaborate dramatically on that on that model as well. So looking at populations works well. Looking at agents, which is what economics has done, may have handicapped it in modelling the complex dynamic system the economy actually is. So it may be that the structure of the economy, which you can model at the aggregate level, may be more important than what isolated agents do. And the relationship between the agents may matter more than their actual individual behaviour. And you can see that coming out of the demand curve work. I showed you, if you actually have you know, downward sloping demand curves and you aggregate, what you get can look like anything at all. It's relationships that come out of income distribution between the agents that dominate even at that level. So structural modelling from the top down, which is what I was doing with predator-prey models a moment ago and what I'll do in future when I start modelling endogenous money, may work much, much better than individual agents. So a way forward may be to build population-type models first and then after we've got those working okay, then do the agent work. I think the agent work's a bit premature. But the intention in both cases should be to replicate the empirical data, rather than abstracting from it almost totally, as you've seen neoclassicals have done, despite Blanchard's comments about the facts. We need to know the data. And there's an excellent study on the data by Kidlin and Prescott, which actually contradicts a lot of neoclassical theory, even though Kidlin and Prescott are staunch neoclassicals. So I'll cover that in the second half of the lecture. See you soon.